The noblest share of Earth is the far western world whose name is written Scotia in the ancient books. Rich in goods, in silver, jewels, cloth and gold. Benign to the body in air and mellow soil. With honey and with milk flow Ireland's lovely plains. With silk and arms, abundant fruit with art and men. Worthy are the Irish to dwell in this their land. A race of men renowned in war, in peace, in faith. Bishop Donatus in Italy, writing admiringly of his Ireland in the ninth century of the Christian era. Today, 1100 stormy years later, it is to Ireland that the admiring people travel. From England, Scotland and Wales, the journey is easy. Sealink has five routes from four ports of departure, everyone able to cope with both passengers and cars. No passports needed for British visitors, either to the Republic or to Northern Ireland. No difficulties about currency or about language. For visitors from across the Atlantic, no problems either. And however you look at it, Ireland's on your way. On your way to England or Scotland or Wales or to Europe or on your way back from these. These are the sea routes, all drive on, drive off. Stranra Laren, just over two hours. Haitian Belfast, seven hours by night and a day service in summer. Hollyhead Dublin, a little more than three hours. Fishcard Rosslare, three and a quarter hours. Haitian Dublin, a new route, seven hours. International airports at Belfast, Dublin, Shannon and Cork. And when you get here, what's so special about this? Empty roads and empty beaches, say some, and it's true. But, as your man said, some come to take a holiday and some to make a holiday. Whatever he meant by that. Forget to bring your car? There's a pretty girl on the quay you can hire one from. So, in no time at all, you're away to the golf links. The game of striking the small hard ball is played throughout Ireland in such a variety of scenery, with such exasperatingly tempting holes and hazards, on 230 courses at the last count. And as a visitor, you're welcome to every one of them. And it's not expensive either. And what if you can't tell the 19th from a hole in the ground? Then look up to the horizon and begin your Irish travels at once. Choose your own vehicle, push slowly and gently out along the quiet roads, and in a leisurely way, keep your eyes open until you see the next thing. What will you see? What will you find? A country of life lived close to the sea, the soil, the rain, the sunshine and the wind. A country that's had its rough times, yes, that's true. What with invasions, wars, famines, rebellions, and Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of England. 
Through the generations, Ireland's young men have gone to fight in foreign wars. For, as George Meredith said, "'Tis Ireland gives England her soldiers, her generals too. They have gone abroad to labour on canals, railways, tubes, skyscrapers, to build the new world. Now, from that roaring world, people turn to Ireland for tranquility, to refresh their bodies and minds by contact with the elemental realities of life. A country of pasture and dairying, of milk and butter and beef. And if you want to start a conversation, just mention the price of beef. A country where the tractor is only now taking over from the horse. A sea-bound country with men born to the fishing. And all of that means work from dawn to dusk amongst the dung and the guts. But also a gracious country where natural rhythms prevail, where life still has a comprehensible pace, a country where there's concern to preserve the best of the traditional crafts and skills and hand them down the generations. A country that missed the industrial revolution, the bad as well as the good of it, and still an unspoiled country, slow to change. But as changes come, there are efforts, part of an international movement, to capture in living folk museums the familiar ways of daily work and leisure before they imperceptibly leak away into oblivion. Good morning. Good morning. May I have it? Yes, love, you can have a lucky horseshoe with your initials on it. And mind you keep it the right way up, or the luck will run out. The water wheel drives a spade mill of the middle of the 19th century moved here stone by stone from its original site and lovingly put into operation again. The Plato's family were spade makers who owned this mill for five generations. beloved objects which are not so very old, that's not the point. They belong to a way of life which is rooted in antiquity. They are living links with the past. The past lives too in castles, mansions and great houses. But the story of Ireland as revealed by her architecture is not a conventional rags-to-riches story. 
For on the whole, the great houses are symbols of an alien concept of life, superimposed upon the innate life of the land. But they, and their foreign-born builders and owners, quite quickly adapted to the life of the country and became absorbed by it. Today, the great houses of the landowners are changing their purposes. Many of them, in the care of the national trusts or directly through their owners, are open for us to admire. Others, again, set in their spreading domains, are now hotels offering luxury and leisure. They're warm with the wayward charm that drifts over Ireland like an enchanted mist. Motels are modern, convenient, practical, and make few demands on the tourist in transit. There are no strict meal times, there's plenty of provision for do-it-yourself, and don't forget to admire the morning view as you wait for the tea to draw. What shall we do? Oh, how about the Farmhouses provide a simpler life. The prices are low, the owner's hospitable, and your kids mix happily with the chickens. Or you can pitch your own tent, choose your own cottage, park your caravan or rent one that's there already. Bring your sleeping bag and live rough if you like, but nearby you'll find the washing machine your wife screams for after a few days of the simple life of the open road and a point for your shaver. Right, that's the creature comforts attended to. Now, how else are you going to amuse yourselves? Do you want to take more water with it? your place, surrounded by sea and punched with lakes. So why not make the wet best of the eternal presence of the water? Nobody's stopping you, and if you're a beginner at this line or that, then there's no one like the Irishman to make the most encouraging noises you ever heard in all your life. Bloody murder, really, and nothing worth cooking in the end. Come ashore and go for the salmon or the trout. Hundreds of miles of rivers and mountain streams. Thousands of lakes. You do best to take local advice about the licenses and close seasons, but anyone in the hotel or the pub will help you. As for coarse fishing, the Irish have never gone in for it and don't see the point. So there are, all over the country, lakes and streams that have never been fished. More water for you? Well, so long as you don't despise the malt. Cadet class dinghies. Kids are so expert these days, they'd sail the scuppers out of their fathers and uncles. Are you still travelling, playing or idling, or picnicking, or walking in the forest parks, following a chance clue to a new thing to wonder at?
So what if the old bird has spent the afternoon drinking at the Bailey? He's in good company. The horse. The Irish horse. Commanding the total devotion of his willing servants. Carrying on his back the aspirations of thousands of would-be show jumpers. The hopes of generations of punters all over the world. Nothing, praise be, will ever replace the Irish horse. But if you insist upon wagering on other sports, you can find all sorts of competition for your money. Not in is free, but peace to be had here too, moored by a lake isle. Are you still journeying? Then let your cruiser nose amongst the reeds so that you can explore the Irish past. For more than 500 years, Ireland was the centre of Christian learning, piety and art. Here grew and flourished the monasteries at Devonish, Clonmacnoise, Glendalough, Cashel. Founded in the 5th and 6th centuries, flowering, triumphing. Sending their scholars and their saints deep into Europe of the Dark Ages. Through all the times of the Viking raiders, the round towers we crick our necks at today were belfries in peace and refuge in raids. Through to the 12th century, long after the first coming of the Anglo-Norman invaders, the Celtic monasteries grew in glory and learning, like Rome reborn, peopled sanctuaries, devoting many lifetimes to the copying and illuminating of books, to the intricate patterning in stone of the Celtic crosses, to the preservation and spread of the only sort of scholarship there was in the Western world, till, slowly and magnificently, the Renaissance brightened the sky of man's mind. All this elaboration of work in penmanship, iron, stone and precious metals, which we group as Celtic, spans a time twice as long as the time from the voyages of Christopher Columbus to the time of the first men on the moon. The faith that built the monasteries and the oratories still shows itself today in church architecture and art, which manifests the 20th century of Christianity. But the newest church, or the oldest Celtic cross, are both young beside the things made by the men of the ancient days. Men, it is thought, first came here about 8,000 years ago, in the Middle Stone Age, after the ice had withdrawn northward toward the pole. They built megalithic graves. They left a few flint implements. They learned to mine and to work gold. They began to farm land. In 6,000 years or so, three times the span of time from the birth of Christ till today, they saw the Stone Age out and the Bronze Age in. And in turn, all men are young and their works are puny beside the works of nature. The Giant's Causeway. 40,000 basalt columns, built, of course, by Finn McCool, as the first stepping stone to Scotland to carry on a war with his enemy, Finn Gaul, who lived in Fingal's cave across the water in the time of the legends. But leave the legends now and come on Lammas Day to the fair of the first fruits. At the old Lama fair, boys, were you ever there? Were you ever at the fair in Ballycastle? Did you treat your Mary Ann to dance and yellow man at the old Lama fair in Ballycastle? Here, as everywhere, you'll find the strongest thing, stronger far than the stout or the whiskey, the people of Ireland. The dealers and the farmers, 
The craftswomen and the colleens and the fishwives, the priests and the curates. All of them close kin to Daniel O'Connell, Charles Stuart Parnell, James Joyce and George Bernard Shaw, to Lady Gregory and W.B. Yeats who created the Irish National Theatre, to Brendan and all the Beans, to Oscar Wilde, Sean O'Casey and Barbara Mullen from the Aran Islands, to Michal McLearmore of the Dublin Gate Theatre, to Louis Metnice and C.S. Lewis and to J.P. Dunleavy, the wild ginger man. Close kin to these and hundreds more. Writers, poets, artists, revolutionaries, scholars, actors, wits, talkers, imbibers. Even to that barrister who lived, they say, in the O of the Oxo advertisement at Lincoln Place, in dear, dirty, elegant Dublin. Worthy are the Irish to dwell in this their land, a race of men renowned in war, in peace, in faith.